How many lies have we been taught? How many bogus stories have we bought? Is it so hard to believe that the entire story we've been told is a complete lie? Lies on top of lies on top of lies. The same people who still land, falsify information, and build schools want to convince you their word is bond. When their words are more like bondage. Shackling well-intentioned minds under the veil of deception. Their institutions are a massive house of cards that will inevitably fall into the abyss of darkness. Our free will to strive to learn the truth stands to magnify the courage of those with the eyes to see and the discernment to illuminate the spirit of wisdom within. That spirit of wisdom guides us through our journey to a destination unknown, being navigated by the compass of fate, which is ultimately a product of our free will. Too many examples of the trusted word of the expert being a finely fabricated lie that sounds convincing when it falls from the mouth of the system's chosen charlatans. Their entire handbook is a psyop, empowering the sheep to stand on their house of cards, emboldened by the lies of the charlatan expert who validates their willingness to accept whatever lie they choose to perpetuate. A call to collective conformity attended by the herd looking for immunity from their own ignorance and laziness. So they choose to vaccinate their spirits with the charlatan's booster, a quick fix for any sheep looking for an easy solution. In the previous episode, we detailed several cities throughout the country that were once thriving ancient metropolitan areas that were either flooded by natural disaster, flooded by the government, or completely destroyed and built upon. And although dozens of cities were mentioned in the video, wisdom tells us that there is indeed a lot more still yet to uncover. One of my favorite subjects to uncover are the artifacts that can't be easily explained. Anytime an artifact is found that doesn't vibe with the scientific or historical template, it is almost immediately labeled a fraud or a hoax. But what about the artifacts that are deemed legitimate? What story are they telling? And do those stories necessarily vibe with that chosen template? In this episode, we continue our investigation into some of the most controversial artifacts supposedly discovered across North America and their connection not only to Egypt, but the old world in general. This artifact has never been disputed. It is a sandstone bird man. What happened to that boy? Found at the great mound of Cahokia, this isn't the only bird man found in the area. Several more have been found, but most have been disappeared by the greasy hand of the charlatan's minions into the dungeons of the secret museum. This image has apparently been analyzed and studied by some of the top archaeologists, and they determine that the cultural significance of this artifact is geographically limited to the immediate area surrounding Cahokia. Even though similarly themed images and relics have been found as far as Florida, a thousand miles away. This particular Birdman is limited to only that region. 
They say this item is unique because it is made of carved sandstone while artifacts found at the other sites were manufactured using different techniques and therefore should be separated based upon those differences. But the important question that rarely gets asked, due in major part as a consequence of this separation, isn't how are they different, but rather how or why are they the same? And what do these similarities say about their differences as a whole? And what similar comparisons can be related to old world mythology? Using the Birdman as an example, we can see similar themed Birdman images scattered throughout the Midwest and Southeast. But when the methodically shackled archaeologist sees these artifacts of a common theme, he must first mind his scientific process. And therein lies the problem with archaeology, or with the charlatan sciences in general. It is as dogmatic as any religion, and in fact, science itself is its own religion. And speaking of religion, could this primitive Birdman image have any religious significance? The scientific charlatan will look at this and say, well, these people coughed sandstone. They'll look at this and say, well, these people coughed shells. They'll look at this and say, these people made copper plates. And the uneducated dummy will say, these people loved that bird nigga. And the archaeologist will reply, well, I'm not sure if that's a bird or a nigga, but that is definitely copa. It's clear that this bird man was a venerated image at one ancient time in pre-Columbian America because its symbology is found in several locations on the continent. But according to the experts, this bird man is not connected to any other cultures from the ancient world. Another common image found throughout the very same region is the eye in hand symbology. Several artifacts displaying this image are also made from different materials. Some made of sandstone, some made of shells, and others even made from copper. But again, these experts say this image isn't connected to any other cultures from anywhere else in the world. But is that really true? Or are they gatekeeping? Quote, Randall H. McGuire, Archaeology of the First Americans. There is a philosophical debate that goes on behind the scenes when archaeologists exhume these graves. And in most cases, as we'll come to see, there is some sort of contention between the archaeologists and the so-called groups of Native Americans. Quote, why are scholars the stewards of Indian pasts? The answer to that question lies in the relationship of archaeology to the larger history of white Native American relations in the United States. And understand from how we know genetics to be, Native American and white at this point is interchangeable. Continuing. Most white American attitudes about Indian people have stemmed from a definition of the Indian as an alien or singular other. Defining Indian people as alien placed them outside the usual rights and privileges of white society. Lumping all Indian people into a single group denied them an identity except in relation to whites. Whites tried to characterize the otherness of Indian people in terms of opposition between the noble savage and the savage savage the noble savage and the savage savage 
Think about that in terms of race or perception and how certain races are viewed by other races. The ideas say more about the psyche and political debates of whites than they do about Indian people, of course. Two more basic ideas about Indian people, however, mediate this seemingly incompatible dichotomy. Most white observers have agreed that the Indian was a primitive other and this other had vanished or was vanishing. The vanishing Indian. I remember Chris Rock had this joke about you never see a group of Native Americans at Red Lobster because they vanished, they disappeared. Because essentially these people never existed. They were a creation by academia. They were a creation by artists. They were the supplanting populations. And then those people eventually got supplanted by whites who didn't honor those treaties. Whether Indians were noble savages or savage savages, there was little doubt that they were primitives. In the Western mind, primitive is a complex notion that entails numerous meanings. Pervasive in most of these meanings is a temporal view that fashions otherness by relegating people to an ancient time with little or no regard for their true place in time. Such people always live in the past. For this reason, the general public and archaeologists tend to treat Indian remains as ancient when the remains are not. The contradiction between the Indian and the savage and the Indian as noble first American has been historically mediated by this notion that Native Americans were vanishing or had vanished. The concept of the vanishing American disarticulated Native Americans from their past. Of course it did. Providing a vehicle by which whites took over Native American heritages for nationalistic and scientific purposes. For nationalistic and scientific purposes. Providing a vehicle by which whites took over Native American heritages for nationalistic and scientific purposes. Think about the first families of Virginia. Think about all of these people who say they have Indian blood or they're related to the great Indian chief and they're essentially white people. So was the Indian chief. This was the process by which they claimed their Indian identities. And much of it included intermarriage or taking over lands. Archaeologists lifted dead Indians from their graves in part to help create a national heritage and the myth of the vanishing Americans. Archaeologists rarely situate their practice in this larger history and therefore frequently fail to understand how the Native American past became their object of study and why many Native Americans are resentful of that fact. And why Native Americans are resentful of that fact. This supposed resentment is based in the idea that these Native American groups are genetically related to the people who are being interred by the archaeologists. And where is this resentment that they speak of founded? The idea that interring graves for the purposes of science and or to learn more about history could also be a reason why you would want, if these are your people, you would want the archaeologist to possibly know more. And this is assuming that that group is genetically related to the people who once inhabited that area that they're assuming this identity and gatekeeping for, so to speak. An understanding of linkage between the development of U.S. Indian policy and the development of U.S. archaeology is a starting point for a dialogue on how to recreate archaeology to reconcile our scientific interests and the interests of modern Native Americans, end quote. This is a perspective on the philosophy that goes on behind the scenes when new discoveries are made in certain areas. NAGPRA, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. The act requires federal agencies and institutions that receive federal funding to return Native American cultural items to lineal descendants and culturally affiliated American Indian tribes, Alaska Native villages, and Native Hawaiian organizations. Cultural items include human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. A program of federal grants assists 
the repatriation process and the Secretary of the Interior may assess civil penalties on museums that fail to comply. NAGPRA also establishes procedures for the inadvertent discovery or planned excavation of Native American cultural items on federal or tribal lands. While these provisions do not apply to discoveries or excavations on private or state lands, the collection provisions of the act may apply to Native American cultural items if they come under the control of an institution that receives federal funding. NAGPRA makes it a criminal offense to traffic Native American human remains without the right of possession or in Native American cultural items obtained in violation of the act. Penalties for a first offense may receive 12 months imprisonment or a $100,000 fine. The Department of the Interior amended NAGPRA in 2023 to clarify steps for its implementation. The amendment, which went into effect January 12, 2024, states, Museums and federal agencies must defer to the Native American traditional knowledge of lineal descendants, Indian tribes, and Native Hawaiian organizations. End quote. I want to say this again. The Department of the Interior amended NAGPRA in 2023 to clarify steps for its implementation. The amendment, which went into effect on January 12th, 2024, states museums and federal agencies must defer to the Native American traditional knowledge of lineal descendants, Indian tribes, and Native Hawaiian organizations. However, the provisions of the legislation do not apply to private lands. The act states that Native American remains and associated funerary objects belong to lineal descendants. If lineal descendants cannot be identified, those remains and objects along with the associated funerary and sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony belong to the tribe on whose lands the remains are found or the tribe having the closest known relationship to them. For all intents and purposes, they could be lineal descendants going all the way back to the Dawes rules. But does that make them a lineal descendant of a mound builder who lived 2,000 years ago? But if you pull this person out of the ground and there is no genetic match between the so-called Indian and the so-called person who lives underneath the earth, what then? Tribes find the burden of proof is on them. If it becomes necessary to demonstrate a cultural relationship that may not be well documented or understood, nowhere has this issue been more pronounced than California, where many small bands that were extinguished before they could be recognized and only a handful obtained federal recognition as Native Americans or descendants of Native American bands. Of course, Congress attempted to strike a balance between the interest in scientific examination of skeletal remains and the recognition that Native Americans, like people from every culture around the world, have religious and spiritual reverence for the remains of their ancestors. And yes, I'm on Charlatan's Web right now. NAGPRA, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. End quote. As we can see, the true objective of this law is set up for certain people who are representing tribal nations to gatekeep information and or new discoveries. It's not just about respecting graves that they say are their ancestors, which we all understand that to be a stretch. The objective of this is simply to put a firewall between new discoveries and the public finding new information. And in the case of new discoveries, they will be filtered through the proper channels before the public will ever see them. If the public ever sees them. In the last episode, we discussed Tennessee and all of the artifacts found throughout the state and the ancient cities flooded by the Tennessee Valley Authority. We also highlighted the rumors of an Egyptian temple that was flooded after the completion of Norris Dam. Many people were surprised to learn about the sheer amount of artifacts found in Tennessee that they had never even heard of. Tennessee rarely gets mentioned among the world's oldest civilizations and cultural hotspots, but indeed it is.
During our investigation into some of these sites, we found several examples of people who held traditions very similar to what we were told about ancient Egyptians. Most notably, their burial customs that included the burial of the dead along with their cherished possessions. Also accompanying these graves was the burial of a dog, drawing a mythological connection to Mesoamerica, the deity Jolot, and the Egyptian deity Anubis. Both cultures believed that dogs were the guides to the underworld and therefore buried them along with the recently deceased. But just as surprising as finding Egyptian burial customs and Egyptian styled idols in these burials is the possibility of finding more artifacts that have an even stronger connection to Mesoamerica. This stands in the face of all the lies we've been told by the so-called experts. So go ahead and tie your shoes and get ready to face them bitches up because we have even more evidence we can use to flush their theories down the shitter. Up since daylight, burdened by the things we try to make right It's gonna be a late night, so much turmoil Makes my blood boil, kundalini encore Earth is some broad, dirt is unsore With one core, tell a story that's some spoil Watch it unfold, stories untold Copyright unsold, books with one spot Ghosts with one soul, they want control You want control, but we share one goal We fight one foe, set your front door And it keeps knocking, but the people care about rocking, yeah it keeps knocking, but the people kept rocking, yeah. Uh -huh. Stop, flex, whatever they do. They can't stop. This article is coming straight from Charlatan's Web, entitled The Michigan Relics. The Michigan relics are a series of alleged ancient artifacts that were discovered during the late 19th and early 20th century. They were presented by some to be evidence that people of an ancient Near Eastern culture had lived in North America and the U.S. state of Michigan, which is known as pre-Columbian contact. Many scholars have determined that the artifacts are archaeological forgeries. The Michigan relics are considered to be one of the most elaborate and extensive pseudo-archaeological hoaxes ever perpetuated in American history. In October 1890, James O. Scottford of Edmore, Michigan, claimed that he had found a number of artifacts, including a clay cup with strange symbols and carved tablets, with symbols that looked vaguely hieroglyphic. The find attracted interest and eager looters arrived to look for more artifacts. Many more elaborate discoveries were made in the area of Montclam County, Michigan following Scottford's original discovery. Scottford was a well-known digger and sign painter in the area of Wyman. He and his company would dig until they located an artifact, and then the dignitaries who sponsored the work were invited to remove the artifact. Within the first year of Scottford's initial discovery, a syndicate was formed in Montclam County of interested parties. The syndicate purchased many of the artifacts and attempted to exploit the fines financially for the region. By 1907, Scottford joined forces with Daniel E. Soper, former Michigan Secretary of State, and together they presented thousands of objects made of various materials, supposedly found in 16 counties across Michigan. Soper had resigned as Secretary of State for the state of Michigan after being accused of embezzlement. The objects included coins, pipes, boxes, figurines, and cuneiform tablets, that depicted various biblical scenes, including Moses handing out the tablets of the Ten Commandments. On November 14, 1907, the Detroit News reported that Soper and Scottford were selling copper crowns that had supposedly been found on the heads of prehistoric kings 
and copies of Noah's diary. Scottford often arranged for a local person to witness him unearthing the objects. Scottford and Soper had many trusting customers who strongly believed in the relics. In 1911, one John A. Russell published a pamphlet, Prehistoric Discoveries in Wayne County, Michigan, in which he argued for their authenticity. James Savage, a former pastor of the Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Detroit, bought 40 of the objects. Savage believed them to be remnants relevant to the descendants of the lost tribes of Israel and continued to believe in the relics until his death in 1927. The book is entitled Prehistoric Specimens from Michigan, USA by Rudolf Etzenhauser. So this is the book that includes details and pictures of the tablets. You can actually see them and you can decide for yourself whether or not these tablets are authentic. Of course, these tablets were labeled a fraud across the board by every known archaeologist and historian and linguist said that these were forgeries and or just a major hoax. So for the people who actually believe in the tablet, the one striking characteristic about these tablets that can't be denied is the use of what they call the mystic symbol. So the mystic symbol you'll see are these three characters that somewhat resemble the IHS from the Catholic Church. So the proponents of these tablets believe that these tablets could not have been faked because several thousand other tablets and artifacts have been found in that area with this mystic symbol. Apparently, there are thousands of legit artifacts with this mystic symbol upon them. So although there is evidence that this mystic symbol that's found all over these Michigan tablets has been found in other locations, it appears that every last one of these is a hoax and a forgery. So many people who push back on this, they'll say, well, I understand some of these do look kind of fake, but how are they all fake? Did someone fake 10,000 tablets and hide them all over the state for different people to find? A little controversy behind these tablets because tablets of a similar design and similar order have been found all over the state. So anytime one of these black tablets shows up that may have some sort of biblical story being told or some sort of ancient script on them, they are immediately labeled a hoax. Are they all hoaxes? Charlatan's Web continuing, the finds attracted the interest of some members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS Church. In 1909, Mormon scientist James E. Talmadge participated in a dig and thoroughly tested the artifacts in his lab back in Utah. His investigations led him to label the artifacts as frauds. In August 1911, he published a work on his findings entitled The Michigan Relics, A Story of Forgery and Deception. Rudolf Etzenhauser, the man who published the book, who was a traveling elder of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, saw the relics as proof of the historicity of the Book of Mormon. Etzenhauser even published a book on his collection of the Michigan Relics. After James Savage died in 1927, he bequeathed his collection of relics to the University of Notre Dame. While at Notre Dame, the relics sat dormant until the 1960s when Milton R. Hunter, president of the New World Archaeological Foundation, uncovered the relics. Hunter spent the rest of his life attempting to use the relics to prove the historicity of the Book of Mormon. Hunter connected the relics to the Michigan mound builders, which he deemed to be the Nephites from the Book of Mormon. Hunter's rhetoric and work with the Michigan relics perpetuated pseudo-archaeology in the region with efforts to prove pre-Columbian contact and the myth of the mound builders. Notre Dame gave Hunter the collection in the 1960s before his death in 1975. He deeded the collection to the LDS church. So Notre Dame just gave the collection to him? Because he was the president of the New World Archaeological Foundation. Hey, okay, we're just going to give it to you. All right. Following Hunter's death, the church kept the collection in their museum in Salt Lake City, Utah for decades. In 2001, the church had the relics examined by Professor of Anthropology Richard B. Stamps of Oakland University and found that the artifacts were made with contemporary tools. 
The LDS church kept 797 of the objects in their Salt Lake City Museum. In 2003, they gave them to the Michigan History Museum in Lansing, where they currently reside. The museum developed an exhibition surrounding the objects called Digging Up Controversy, the Michigan Relics, which was on display in the fall and winter of 2003. End quote, Charlatan's Web. Two of the main issues concerning these tablets are one, the people who were funding the digs, and apparently the history of the people who were claimed to have found these artifacts. If a person who is found guilty of a person who is rumored to have embezzled money finds an artifact, there's a chance that that artifact may be fake. I don't think that's a stretch for anyone to come to that conclusion. And another issue with these tablets is the fact that they've been used by Mormons to try to legitimize the Book of Mormon and or the history of the Book of Mormon. We also have from the greater world of academia, the idea that there was any transatlantic contact must be disputed at all costs. The real question is, is there any consistency among these tablets? And the people who believe in these tablets do have a point. How can you fake 10,000 tablets and put them in different places? There seems to be credible points on both sides of whichever you believe about these relics. Okay, yes, they're fake, but how many people faked these relics over a certain period of time? And of course, these tablets are extremely important to Mormons. Mormons, for the most part, are, are ostracized religiously from other sects of so-called Christians. Because it's still the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but the Mormons have a completely different history surrounding the narrative of Jesus. And part of that narrative, according to the Mormons, is that Jesus Christ lived in America. So if you think America is Egypt is a crazy concept, try Jesus in Detroit. Christ in Cleveland. After going through this book of the Michigan relics, I've analyzed a lot of these photos of these tablets. It's not as though those individual qualities of being sloppily done or even rushed make them fake necessarily. But the idea that all of these are authentic and legit has to be, uh, uh, that, that's a no for me, dog. These don't all look legit. Some of these to me look fake. I've seen a lot of tablets. I'm not an archaeologist, but I've seen a lot of tablets. But we're still looking at it from the wrong angle. Because even if these tablets are fake, are they faking a specific template? Are there 9,999 fakes and only one original? You see my point here? That, yes, most likely, in my opinion, there are some fake tablets. Appears to me that there may be a significant number of fake tablets. But are these fake tablets based upon a real template? When I look at these tablets, some of them remind me of the tablets that came out of Burroughs Cave. But they're like a counterfeit version of those tablets. We know a lot of archaeologists will say that the Burroughs Cave tablets are fake. But many of those look legit to me and there may be some fakes in that batch as well. But I think the detail, if you look at the craftsmanship on certain tablets, and that's the striking characteristic about some of these tablets, is that is the feeling that these tablets were rushed or not made with any elite level of craftsmanship. 
So are all of these tablets fake or are there actually some legit ones? Because if there are some legit ones, those are the ones we should be paying attention to. Because the tablets that get propagated look questionable, the entire batch is questionable. So we have the questionable nature of the types of people who come across these tablets, who many people would call swindlers of some sort. If they're not swindlers, they're a Mormon. And many people think Joseph Smith was a swindler. That is somewhat of an opinion shared by some people who are familiar with Mormonism. But I think the real question is, is there a legit template by which these fakes were being made? Because we do see this black slate sandstone and it looks and appears to be similar to other sandstone tablets that have been authenticated, apparently. Again, in my opinion, I do think that there is a real template behind this, which means they are using a template of a real artifact to create all of these fake artifacts. So if somebody does find something legit, if you really wanted to debunk them, you would just go around and make a bunch of fake artifacts that appeared similar. So if you found a cache of a hundred real artifacts and you know they're legit, what do you do? You go make a thousand fake ones that look like the real ones. The hidden hand poisons the entire well. This book is called The Mound Builders, Their Works and Relics by Reverend Stephen Pete. And another thing that should be mentioned is the fact that the people who are funding many of these archaeological digs happen to be religious people, similar to this guy, Reverend Stephen D. Pete. The problem with religion when it comes to science, and I think this is the issue that many people have with Mormons. And the issue with these new discoveries when they're found by religious people or religious people fund certain things, in many ways, there is a religious agenda. So this is kind of the root of the reason why people don't trust Mormons. When many of these unusual artifacts are found, somewhere there's a Mormon involved. Or even if a Mormon isn't involved in finding the artifact, the Mormon wants to use that artifact for his own agenda, which is trying to prove the Book of Mormon. And I could say the same thing about, well, I'm trying to prove my Egyptian agenda. I'm not looking for the Egyptians who traveled to America. I'm not looking for modern Egyptian in America. And I think that's what people don't quite understand. So chronology is so important here. Things change over time, just like language changes over time. They can't define themselves. They can't speak in the tongue and write in the language of the oppressor who gets to prop his information at the top because he is the ruler of the system. So these histories are what they say they are. Jumping ahead to page Ho, otherwise known as 304. These inscribed shells were found in Tennessee. Do they look like they resemble anything from any other culture? But of course, they'll tell you there was no connection between any Mississippian and any Aztec. No connection. They'll tell you there's no connection between any Mississippian and any Olmec. They'll tell you there's no connection between any Mississippian and any Maya. And then when they do make the connection, once again, it's the Egyptians visiting America vacation theory. Similarly, it had to be the Mayan vacation theory. Oh, the Mayans came to Georgia. The Mayans came to Georgia? Or did Georgians go to Maya? So the Aztecs, what they did, they made all of the monuments in right there in the Central Valley of Mexico. So what they did, they made all of these great monuments and then they come make these shitty fucking shells. Yeah, we're making 
geometric masterpiece gargantuan pyramids out here in Mexico, but we're, we're going to show up here and we're going to put these shitty shells together. Looks like a codex. Look at the iconography. Very similar to whom? But we all know there's there's no connection, bro. No fucking connection. Another thing they try to do is they try to disconnect nations of people by distance. This object shows up in Ohio and this object shows up in Tennessee. They'll be like, oh, the, the people in Ohio traded with the people in Tennessee. Or you'll see an object in Georgia and the same object in Ohio. And they'll be like, oh, wow. Can you believe the trade networks between Ohio and Georgia? Like, nigga, my cousin lives in Ohio. And my brother lives in Georgia. Is, is it possible? Is it possible that all the way in the Yucatan, someone could be related to someone in Ohio? Is it possible? So they use these little small trade connections between villages and small tribes to downplay the national identity of many people, even though people are tribal and should have different identities and different clans and families. The disconnection of a nationalistic identity is used against these civilizations to downplay their historical significance. Charlatan's Web, Brigido Lara. Brigido Lara is a Mexican artist and ex-forger of pre-Columbian antiques. Lara claims to have created perhaps as many as 40,000 pieces of forged pre-Columbian pottery. Brigido Lara began to create forgeries in the 1950s and 60s. He created many items in the style of Mayans, Aztecs, and especially the lesser known Tontanacs. In fact, to such an extent that the majority of purported Tontanac artifacts may actually be of his creation. He worked in a museum where he was acquainted with both original artifacts and potential customers. Lara sold his work as genuine Mexican antiquities. Buyers did not ask many questions because they were buying contraband. Taking antiquities out of Mexico is illegal. Some of the works were sold by the Morton D. May Collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, dated 400 to 700, and attributed to the Ramajotas culture in Veracruz. In 1971, the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History presented a large exhibition entitled Ancient Art of Veracruz. Laura later recognized many exhibits as his work. In July 74, Mexican police arrested a group of what appeared to be antique smugglers, with Brigido Lara among them. An antiquities expert declared Lara's forgeries genuine. While serving his prison sentence, Lara requested fresh clay to prove his innocence and created just the items he was accused of smuggling. The same antique expert declared them genuine as well. Lara was released in January 1975. Okay. That's a pretty, that's a cool story. They're like, listen, man, we, you are arrested for stealing this contraband. You can't steal this contraband out of Mexico. He's like, man, no, that shit is fake. And then they go to the, to the dealer. They go to the charlatan. They're like, no, this is genuine. This is genuine. That nigga was like, yo, give me some fucking clay, bro. This fool done made the same shit that the old dude said was genuine, and then he said the new shit was genuine too. That's like, you know what? We gonna get, we gonna go ahead and let you get up out of here, bro. The Museo de Antropologia de Zalapa later hired Lara as a restorer and to recognize forgeries. In '87, Lara told his story to two journalists from Connoisseur Magazine. Through them, the St. Louis Art Museum heard that their Morton D. May collection contained his forgeries. Through them, the St. Louis Art Museum heard that their Morton D. May collection contained his forgeries. The Dallas Museum of Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art also recognized they had Lara forgeries in their collections, though they initially claimed that there was no proof. 
1999, he was featured in the documentary film Ruins, directed by Jesse Lerner. The film screened at the Sundance Film Festival and in many museums around the world, giving him further exposure. Laura continues to sculpt in ancient styles, but now signs his work and is a licensed maker of replicas. He calls his previous forgeries his originals or his original interpretations. End quote, Charlatan's Web. That's a, that's a charlatan for the web right there, bro. This dude created an entire history. And what did the charlatans do? They put his work in museums and called them genuine and dated them a thousand years old so this guy sculpted something 20 years ago and then they actually say that his sculptures are older than the entire mississippian civilization just to put that bullshit into perspective that should let you know that the chronology attached to most of these findings is bullshit that should also let you know radiocarbon dating is bullshit which we've discussed at nauseum in The Smartest Beast in the Field. He created entire civilizations of fake artifacts. There's one report that says that it could be up to 80% of these new so-called artifacts are actually forgeries. So yeah, he's the hidden hand creating forgeries, but who is the hidden hand saying that those forgeries are legit? So we know that there's a hidden hand that's keeping legitimate artifacts from ever seeing the light of day. Because a nigga could make something in 1985 and they say that shit's from 1985 BC. And then they hang it in a fucking museum. And we just take their word for it. And all the yuppies at the wine mixer stand around a piece of shit made 20 years ago and talk about how ancient it was. Don't give me a forgery that looks like everything that's not forged. Because they had a specific look and design he was keen on forging things to look like certain things. If you're going to give me a forgery, give me, give me a good forgery. So you can tell that even the curators at the museum, he knew exactly who his customers were. He was looking for yuppies. And he played them. Not only did he play the yuppies, he played yuppies and he played the authorities. Because once they arrested his ass, he's like, nigga, that was a fake, man. You know, I'm out here faking this shit. I know I told you it was real, but it got too real when y'all took me to jail. It's actually not real. I can prove it. Fucking Phil at the wine mixer. Oh, look at this. It's ancient. Oh, yeah. Shut the fuck up, Phil. Shut up. Let's go to Quora. Would the Mississippian culture have any awareness of the existence of the Aztec culture? This is from Dr. Andrew McKenzie linguistics professor at the university of kansas aztec i doubt it because the question of synchronicity the two cultures weren't really thriving at the same time he says the aztec triple alliance rose to power in the mid 1400s and didn't even leave the valley of mexico to close to 1500 the mississippian culture is hard to pin down chronologically but its peak was around 12 to 1300 and it was in the severe decline by 1400 when cities like cahokia were already abandoned by the time de soto's expedition passed through the now u.s southeast in the 1540s the mississippian culture had already practically vanished wow wow they were gone by the time de soto got here the mississippians had already vanished Soto was like, damn, these people were, they're, they're vanished. They're vanished. There was a hidden hand behind all of the bullshit. By the time the Aztecs were garnering tribute from the states along the coast of Mexico, which had engaged in trade with the Gulf states and the now U.S. Southeast, the Mississippian culture was already in the throes of its unexplained collapse and unlikely to have the time to conduct much foreign trade. I thought the news made it north. This is a linguistics professor. Because I'm sure there's no linguistic connection between the cultures at all. Matt Rigsby, MA Archaeology, Boston University. There's no evidence indicating they did. No Aztec artifacts have been found in regions occupied by Mississippian cultures. While there was some traffic in goods like coca beans and turquoise between American Southwest and Mexico, Mexican items don't appear that far east. And when Cabeza de Vaca made the long walk from Florida to Mexico, there's no mention I'm aware. I'm aware that anybody in what became the American Southeast knew anything at all about conditions in Mexico. Because, you know, Cabeza de Vaca, he knew, all, he knew it all. 
And he wrote it all in his book because he already knew it all. The foreign hand gets to tell you indigenous history. Matt fucking Rigsby. Matt fucking Rigsby and Dr. Andrew McKenzie. See what they're teaching? You see what you see? You see the education system? Bear witness. And these people with these degrees. No, I doubt it. They didn't. They weren't even existing at the same time. La, 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 la. Shut the fuck up. Andrew McKenzie and fucking rig bitch. Shut up. Even to the untrained eye, the style of this Birdman image resembles something that you might see somewhere else. Can't really think of where. But the mainstream archaeologist will steer clear of this subject because his methodology is divided by jurisdictional scheme. How dare you Mississippian scholars muddy the waters of our pristine Mesoamerican institutions of established fuckery. We are not in no way, shape, or form involved in any Mississippi dump. All right? And there it was. The academic world would stay quiet regarding any relationship between the Mississippians, the Mexica, and the Maya. And any approach to this subject was surely to leave a man ostracized from the Harvard wine mixer. A college professor is better off propagating UFOs and alien explorers than to take up arms in this crusade. As far as they were concerned, long before Donald Trump, there was a wall that stretched the length of the Rio Grande, essentially blocking any communication between civilizations. And if Mayans couldn't make it to the Mississippi, how the hell could Egyptians make it to America? But this series isn't called Egyptians in America. It's called America is Egypt. But America isn't just Egypt. America is the true old world and the ancient holy land. This book is entitled Maya, the Riddle and Rediscovery of a Lost Civilization by Charles Gallenkamp. This book was gifted to me by Harry Hubbard. In the book past page 113, there's a section of photography of different, it looks like Mayan temples. I'm at figure 92. Limestone standard Bera, Chichen Itza. Statues such as this were designed to hold wooden poles in their hands to which banners or flags were attached. And they usually were placed at entrances to temples or palaces. Early post-classic height, 37 and a half inches. Does this image resemble anything? Because I might be tripping, maybe I'm tripping, but this looks nearly identical. When I say nearly identical, I mean nearly identical to the statues found at Etowah. I'm looking here at this statue and I'm looking at the statue found in Etowah and I'm thinking, these people are the same. And then I find identical statues in Tennessee. So now we have a connection between Tennessee, Georgia, and the Yucatan. I wouldn't lie to y'all about the Ying Yang twins, obviously. Because right here we can see a connection. On the very same page, figure 93, figure of a seated dignitary that was originally attached to the facade of a building at Chichen Itza. Height 34 inches. Look at this. Look at the picture of this seated dignitary. He almost looks like this artifact, which was found in Ohio. If I'm not tripping, I might be tripping. I see this guy from Ohio. I see a statue from Chichen Itza. But all of the smartest and most Accredited people studying these subjects say there is no connection. If you notice a connection, you're not accredited, by the way. Or they will try to discredit you. 
That is discredit worthy. That is slander worthy. How dare you? Preposterous connections. Preposterous. This man is no academic. Because if he was, he would know that we never, we never speak of such a thing in absurdity. The Maya in Ohio, right? Right, you can tell me that in Indiana too, right? Preposterous. This image is from the Georgia Historical Society via the Etowah Papers. Look at this nigga right here. Figure 68. This stone image of a human being probably intended to serve as an idol was found by Professor Warren K. Moorhead in a mound of the Great Etowah Group on Etowah River, Cartersville, Georgia. The image, which is the size of a five-year-old boy, was buried in a stone grave, exactly as though it were the burial of a human being. Look at this. Found in Georgia. That don't look like anything anywhere else. They are lying to you. So here's what these assholes do. Whenever they find something at one of these excavations, the finding, especially if it's very significant, if it's a historically significant finding, they will hide that shit under the museum. Or someone will take that very unusual and or special artifact and hide it from the public. We think for the most part, the things that we see are the gist of it, especially when we're talking about artifacts. It's always arrowheads and pottery, all of these objects of seemingly lower interest. And then there are artifacts that if the public knew about, they would be extremely interested in them. If you found something at a legit excavation, that didn't necessarily vibe with the historical narrative, of course tons of people would be interested. And this is where the heathen charlatan comes in and he decides whether or not the public gets to hear about these findings. So I wanna bring your attention to this artifact. It's a very peculiar looking artifact. This was found in Manville, Georgia. Now I want to bring your attention to this artifact. This artifact was found in Indiana. Look at these two figurines. Look at these two faces. They seem to share a common characteristic. They both have that Mayan nose where the nose actually extends above the bridge of the eyes. It's that prominent Mayan nose. You don't have to be an archeologist to see these features. There's clearly a connection to the Maya. What we call this pre-Maya or what the new school diffusionists say, oh man, Mayans must have migrated to motherfucking Indiana. That's what they'll say, Mayans went to Indiana. Mayans went to Georgia. Not that niggas from Indiana went to the Yucatan, they won't say that. That is. At no point, that point will never be made by those people. Even though we can clearly see a primitive version of Mayan culture in Indiana, in the Midwest. Well, look at this. 
This is called the leek figurine, also found in the Midwest. Look, look, look at this pudding face, motherfucker. He got that pudding face. Look like the nose is broke off. What does this figure resemble? Look, just, just look at the, look at the pudding face. Look at the slant eyes. What does he resemble? We got one pudding face nigga and two big nose niggas. Big nose Mayan looking niggas, right? One pudding face nigga. And what does this pudding face nigga look like? He almost resembles something between an Olmec head and a Buddha statue. Like an Olmec Buddha. And we can see here in Indiana, we have more Olmec Buddha style art. This is at the Man Hopewell site, by the way. Now look at this. We got three pudding heads all found in the same place along the Ohio River in Indiana. So now we got one pudding head nigga, two pudding head niggas, three pudding head niggas, four pudding head niggas. But what if I told you that something else was found in the very same area? Well, look at this shit right here. Because if I'm not mistaken, that looks like a winged serpent. That jumped straight off Mario, brother, cuz. If I'm not mistaken, that looks like something that would be hanging off the side of a Mesoamerican pyramid. But it's found along the Ohio River. This is a legitimate artifact, but there's no connection to Mesoamerica. It just so happens to be something that... Res he wouldn't even say this resembled anything in Mesoamerica. But look at this. This looks like an image that would be hanging off the side of a Mesoamerican pyramid. But it was found in Indiana? What's so special about Indiana? We got pudding head niggas, big nose Mayan looking niggas, and winged serpents. That's Mario Brothers right there, boy. How the fuck did all these niggas get to Indiana? Well, that's a stupid question. Maybe the question you should be asking is, how the fuck did all these niggas get to the Yucatan? But maybe the people from the Midwest migrated to the Yucatan. Maybe the people from the Midwest migrated to the Central Valley of Mexico. Their narrative of world history is a house of cards and it is folding before our eyes. They'll tell you there's no connection between these two cultures and yet... I must be a fucking idiot because I see these big nose niggas. I see pudding headed niggas. I see wooden identical fucking statues and I see winged serpents all in areas that should not be connected to the Yucatan or the central Valley of Mexico. And if you're asking, how does this make America, Egypt, you're not fucking getting it. You need to go back to episode one, fam. If you don't understand, you need to start over from the beginning because we've covered a lot of subjects here. And I'm happy to be able to get on these pudding face niggas who are in Indiana. Big nose niggas in Indiana. Serpents in Indiana. The reason these charlatans can perpetuate their false agendas is because they hide this information. The question should be, how much more shit that's like this that's still out there or has already been found and hidden? Because if we're finding very rare artifacts and they're matching patterns from other places, there's obviously something missing from the story. To the, lies of your mind. the truth is missing.
You see this symbol here? Now the scholars and archaeologists call this a hand and eye symbol. Several other hand and eye symbols, thousands even, have been found in mounds throughout the entirety of North America. Here are a few more examples. You see that there? But would you know that this symbol also resembles a Hamza? What? And did you know that they say that the Hamza originated in Mesopotamia? Although you'll be hard pressed to ever find one of these that is as old as, let's say, one of those.